Uh, we're really excited to be here uh, remotely, of course, uh, with Bernard. Uh, it's really been, uh, uh, Bernard and I have known each other for quite a while. So we're, we, we know each other uh, here at SWAN, uh, but now we get to talk a little bit more in front of an audience. And we're excited to have you, Bernard, for this evening talk, which we do twice a year around the context of our biannual auctions. So welcome. I thank, guess... thank you for having me on the show, Nigel. Glad <laughs> to be here. Well, it's it's exciting. Um, we have a great audience for, for us tonight. Uh, I'd like to begin by giving you a formal introduction. Uh, Bernard Lumpkin is our guest, and Bernard is a contemporary art collector. He's a patron and educator. And Bernard and his husband, Carmine Bacuzzi, over the past decade have formed the Lumpkin Bakutsi family collection of contemporary art. And this is one of the country's most exciting collections of contemporary art centered on established and mostly emerging artists of African descent. And uh, they have a wonderful commitment to these artists, a broader mission for institutional advocacy and support. And uh, this family collection, it is a family collection, is now the subject of a wonderful best-selling book, which I encourage you all to have, which I have here as a nice prop, Young, Gifted, and Black, A New Generation of Artists. And this has been a national uh, traveling exhibition since 2019, curated by Antoine Sargent and Matt Wyckoff. Um, and Bernard is also very involved in art institutions. Bernard sits on the board of the trustees of the Studio Museum in Harlem and the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. And Bernard is also involved in the Whitney Museum and the Museum of Modern Art on various committees. And uh, we're, we're really excited to have Bernard. Bernard comes with a, an interesting background, a PhD in comparative literature from Harvard University. So uh, we're, we're really excited to have you here, Bernard. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, as I've known you as a, as a collector and a frequent guest here at SWAN, um, we're really interested in your journey, how you began as a collector. Uh, let's go back a little bit in time. And, and can you tell us about your, what were some of your formative experiences in art and culture? What, what, what started you on this journey? Uh, well, thank you, Nigel. First of all, again, just want to reiterate, um, uh, my gratitude for your asking me on the show. It's um, so much of what I do. Is <clears throat> so much of what I do is about uh, community and conversation. Um, you know, no one teaches you, at least no one taught me how to be a patron, um, how to collect art. But I have learned thanks to uh, a group of um, by surrounding myself with people who were willing to teach me and share. And I also uh, approach art collecting just like I do anything with a real um, sort of passion and desire to learn. And so everything that I do, I try to take that approach. So speaking to your audience tonight is something which I feel, um, which I hope that younger patrons and younger collectors get a chance to do more of in the future. And so that's why I'm here and I appreciate your giving me the opportunity to to speak with you all tonight. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I think you're a wonderful cultivator of a group of contemporary artists and culture and and, and the auction house is a, is a place where we try, we aspire to do that as well. So yeah, I, I thought we could just begin with, uh, to go back to my question, um, we're, we sure. come from different backgrounds, so everybody has some sort of, I think, um, formative experience that really shapes their uh, way they approach art. Um, and some of the great things about this job is learning about people's different backgrounds. And I think uh, it's a good introduction to know a little bit more about you as a person. So can you tell us a bit more about your, your formative experiences in art and culture and- Sure. How did you uh, get involved in, in, in going yeah, I guess and going to where I am? <laughs> it's an interesting journey. Um, and, be, be, and by that, I mean, it had many different uh, sort of stages and chapters. Um, I can think of specific um, 
some moments first, th then I'll give a more sort of linear chronological story, but some moments that I think were important for me. Um, you know, my father was African-American and he grew up in Watts. And as a kid, this was a time when I was growing up in San Diego, so near Los Angeles. And my father was a professor at UCSD. My parents were both teachers. Um, I didn't grow up going to museums or I didn't grow up looking at art or having art on the walls, but I learned, I grew up with parents who believed in education and the value of education and learning in all of its forms. So that was sort of my, my earliest sort of sense of how to conduct oneself in the world, whatever it was that you did, was sort of with curiosity, with the sort of intellectual uh, zeal as it were, and with a desire to learn about the world around you. Um, so when I was a kid, you know, we were growing, I was growing up in San Diego. My father was a professor at UCSD, professor of physics, uh, which was very interesting for me because I understood very little about math at that time. But I would watch my father work and the way he worked on physics, it was very theoretical. For me, it was very much um, what I think of now is what an artist does and sort of an artist goes into uh, their mind and it's always starts with an idea of something, even if you're not an abstract artist or a conceptual artist, there's always an idea. And so that vision of my father sitting at our dining room table growing up as a kid working on problems for me was sort of akin to what I think of now as when an artist goes to their studio. Um, isolated, you know, not isolated as in separated from the world, but just alone with their work. And he would work for hours with a sort of discipline and a focus and a fervor, which I now associate with what great artists do. Mm -hmm. um, another memory I have from growing up in San Diego was we would visit my father's family in Los Angeles. And one of the places that he would take me to is the Watts Towers. Some of you already know what the Watts Towers is, a community center, a living, breathing sculpture at that time in the, six, in the 70s and 80s, uh, which was still being built. And it was built with the help of the community. It was a sort of giant sculpture made of shards, pieces of glass, uh, tossed off, sort of recycle the stuff we would recycle now. Uh, and so for me as a child, seeing the Watts Towers in formation, and which then would eventually become a community center, an art center, it was right in Watts, in the neighborhood where my father's family was. It was not in a museum that was across town that was separated from the community. And it was a project that was a, a sort of social, what, what Rick Lowe calls you know, social work. Um, it was a social practice at the time. Maybe that term didn't exist then. And for me, that was looking back on it, an early exposure to a kind of art that I would not have learned otherwise. It was not art that existed within the walls of a museum. It was not, um, I didn't have to go somewhere and feel separate from my life or my family or my roots to experience art. It was happening all around me in the community and it was participatory. There were children who would bring buckets of shards and broken plates to the artist, Simon Rodia, who was building this sculpture, which really had no end. And it just continued and- It's like a Gaudi cathedral. Yes. Exactly, exactly. And so looking back for me, I think I took away from that a sense of number one, Art isn't just oil and acrylic and canvas. It can be made of everyday objects all around you. You can make art from your, the stuff of your own life. Uh, and what other people throw away can become art. Number two, I took away from it that art can also exist in the community, that it doesn't have to be indoors, locked away in a museum on a wall. It can happen all around you. And number three, art can be something that you participate in. So for a kid growing up, without parents who had a lot of money for art or for going to museums or for collecting, I learned sort of along the way through moments like that about the value of art, the value of art in a, in a social educational context. The Watts Towers is now a community center. There are artists who teach there, there are classes. And I also realized that, you know, art was something that could happen with, um, you know, in your own community. And it's something that I often tell collectors who are starting out, you know, I always say, make, find what your passion is as a collector, whether it's a medium specific passion or a time period, 
and then align yourself with institutions that share that passion or will who will forward your your interests for instance myself being a board member of the studio museum or supporting the yale school of art or being a trustee at the studio at the um, scott hegan school of painting and sculpture my focus is emerging artists it's artists of african descent and those institutions have helped learn have helped teach me what it is that I am hoping to accomplish and have modeled for me and provided context and community for art collecting, which otherwise I feel would be a relatively solitary and separate endeavor. Um, and from those institutions, I've also learned about community and sharing the work that you have. And what Thelma Golden talks about in reference to the Studio Museum, creating a space where artists can come together and where artists and the rest of the world can come together. And I feel that, you know, that doesn't have to just be a museum space. You can make your home that kind of a space. You can share the work that you have in your collection. You can have events for, for organizations. You can invite artists over, curators, collectors. Um, you know, I love that, I love being an art collector, obviously, but I joke often, I tell people, you know, I'm not really a collector, I'm a connector. And for me at this point, I feel like the most pleasure and the most purpose comes from connecting artists with curators, collectors with museums and building community around a shared focus and a shared interest. Uh, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah, I think um, that's a wonderful example, um, taking the Watts Towers and showing how that community is, uh, an early example that you, you 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 grew up with, and now you're creating a new kind of environment, a new community, uh, which is invaluable to young artists, young contemporary artists, um, and and especially in a in a very kind of unforgiving environment like New York, which is <laughs> competitive. People are coming in uh, with high aspirations and um, working in a, in a you know, studio environment where um, patrons and the commodification of the art and and the kind of um, commercialization of the art create a lot of pressures on young artists. And um, often collectors aren't patrons today. So you've really kind of shaped yourself not just as a, a collector of art, but a supporter of artists. And that is that is unquestionably the 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 purpose behind your collection, traveling, and, and being in so many people's lives, young, gifted, and Black. One uh, more, just, just Nigel, on that point, you know, one more biographical note, which folks might find interesting, is that my, um, you know, and I write about this in the essay to the book, which was really, the essay is called A Family Collection, and it's really about my story and my family's story in terms of how it connects to my advocacy for artists. But both of my parents were in their own way activists in their time. My father was at Columbia University here in New York during the 60s, and he was very involved with creating an open admissions policy at City College, um, whereby every high school graduate in New York City would have access to a free education. Mm -hmm. um, so the 60s were a time, you know, of, you know, for him, that was his academic civil rights, as it were. He was a PhD student, he was a physicist. Um, he wasn't marching in the streets per se, but he was working behind the scenes to further his belief in the value of education and making it accessible to all. So it's another example, I think, for me of that, you know, when I look back and I think about what inspired me or what examples I had for, you know, thinking of, you know, myself as a collector, not so much as a private person, but as a public figure and having a public voice and using art as a tool to educate um, and bringing more people into the conversation. You know, uh, I look to my father as an example and my mother too, in her own way also, they met at Columbia University. She was studying uh, French literature and he was a physicist. And, you know, my mother was from Morocco, from Tangiers. She was from North Africa. My father was African-American. So I feel that they also, you know, in their own purpose and their own work in their own lives, set an example for me of, um, you know, celebrating diversity, exploring what it means to be different, and also, you know, helping others in the world understand those values. 
Well, that's, that's that's wonderful. I think your your family, uh, the richness of your upbringing and your 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 parents' pursuits has really informed your your idea of a of a practice and your you obviously have spent a lot of time thinking about how to approach the work and the artists and, and this kind of singular pursuit. And it used to be a very kind of, you said it was, an, I mean, it was an isolated practice for artists many, many times ago. I'm, I'm actually a Columbia grad myself. Oh, wow. M MFA. Uh, and, and I know how it is to be an artist. Back then in the 90s, uh, MFAs weren't uh perused by collectors and dealers. The MFA exhibitions weren't uh, your testing ground. You had to wait until later, you know, galleries and expectations uh, were quite different. Today, uh, artists have wonderful opportunities, but there's also so many voices competing, so many uh, different, um, you know, th th there's, there's opportunity, but there's, immense competition. And I, I would love to hear a little bit more about your collecting practice, how you have, uh, what affinity do you see in certain artworks or artists? Your, your collection's wonderfully diverse, uh, but it also ha has certain center, centers, I would call them. Uh, one harks back to the Watt Center, artists who use collage, artists who use found objects. Um, and I, I think, you know, I wondered if you would sort of speak a little bit further on a, one or two artists or a group of artists that have, um, that you've built around, because I think it probably grew organically. Uh, coll collections don't happen overnight. So, so perhaps you could give us an anecdote or a story of what you, what sort of the, the, the pieces that you first connected to? I mean, I think a lot of collectors are built around a few core pieces or an artist. Could you give us an example of something that that set you on this journey? Right. No, that's interesting, Nigel. I hadn't I hadn't thought about that. That collectors do uh, can start with a core. You know, you build from a foundation which which consists of an artist or a group of work or maybe a kind of of work because. I think I do that in the installation in the house. I think about, you know, I try to be, be like a curator. I'm always telling curators, I'm like a wannabe curator. And I try to think about conversations among works, you know, either materially, material affinities or conceptual, um, conceptual um, conversations as it were. Uh, we have a work which is actually made of cement. Uh, it's a um, diptych. And it's made by an artist named Jarrett Key, whose work you can currently see on view right now at 1969 Gallery, a recent graduate of RISD, and is hanging next to a wall. So it's like a fresco, which is, as we know, like a medieval practice. But I love it when an artist, contemporary artist, sort of re reintroduces us, reminds us, and redefines a, a, you know, a practice and a methodology which we don't associate with contemporary art making. Um, so he's making essentially what is a fresco in 2022. And it hangs next to a fabric work by Eric Mack. Uh, for those of you who know Eric Mack's work, he frequently uses clothing, um, other textile materials, uh, moving blankets, uh, and makes these beautiful sort of abstract, yet referencing the body and bodies, installations, works, wall works. So, in my mind, I often, you know, I, I use that actually to tell this, the kids, I say, Lucy, look, you can make art from cement and you can, you can build a collage or, a, a, you know, a sculpture out of your own clothing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like there's ways of using examples, uh, you know, buildings from a foundation or idea or a concept. Um, but the other point, which you, in your question, Nigel, reminds me that, you know, I always tell collectors who are starting out that it's, it's great to have a focus. Um, and I love the collections. And when I was sort of learning and thinking about how to build my own focused collection, I didn't just look at other collectors of African-American art. I didn't just look at other collectors of emerging artists. I looked at people who focused on photography. I looked at people who focused on, you know, late 20th century abstraction. I looked at people who focused on, um, you know, 
uh, artists that were focused around a certain period or, 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 you know, um, place in the world. Mm -hmm. For me, it's the, it's the idea of having a focus, a vision. Mm -hmm. That's what I think you need to, what one can learn. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't learn about collecting African-American art by looking only at African-American collectors. I, le I learned about focusing and building a compelling collection of African-American art by looking at how other collectors had coalesced artists, ideas around a certain focus or theme. Um, you know, I feel like an art collection is, is like, you know, going back to school, it's like an essay, it's an argument. You should have a thesis. You should be making a point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, artists in their own work, I feel often, you know, their work should be judged on their own parameters, the own goal, their own goals that they set. You know, when I'm in a, in a studio with an artist, I'm not thinking about or asking about, you know, well, do who such and such thinks this work is successful. I'm always asking them, you know, do you think you succeeded? What was what were your parameters? What was your goal with this work? And do you feel you succeeded? And mm -hmm. by the same token, I feel that collectors in building your collection and thinking about how you hang work on the walls of your home, think about a point you're making, an argument you're making. For me, it comes from a personal place. I'm trying to demonstrate, you know, the versatility and the agility that artists of African descent have across mediums, as I just explained with the example of Jarrett Key and Eric Mack. And I'm also telling a story about identity and family and history for my own children to learn so that they can look on the walls and see you know, in their, in the work that they live with, the heritage, their own roots. Um, it just has to have some argument or a point. And that's where the vision part comes in. And that's where you see collections with a vision. And for me, those are the most inspiring collections. That's, that's, that's a great point. I, I think it must have then, when you put together this book and um, uh, working uh, of course, with uh, Antoine Sargent, the editor of this book, you you had to. It was quite a selective process. Then, uh, who, are the, who are the artists we're going to discuss? Uh, was that was that a difficult selection? Uh, you know, it's one of those like fun challenges, right? <laughs> it's sort of like having a budget when you're a collector. It's like, well, I would love to get those three things, but I only have the budget or the space or the purpose, you know, to get to. So which of the two do I choose? Um, I think parameters, again, something which artists themselves will tell you, parameters are good. They force you to prioritize. They force you to really distill what your focus and purpose is. Um, the wonderful thing about doing the book with Antoine and also with Matt Wyckoff, who had worked with me on the collection for many years was, you know, in a sense, I'm the first pass, right? The, the collector is, you know, I, I get to be the first chooser and selector of the story I'm telling with the collection. Um, but when you invite someone else in, they then give their point of view, their perspective, their, they tease out their own story or different stories from the collection. Um, and that's what's really exciting about the opportunity of sharing is that you get a chance to have a new set of eyes, a fresh point of view on the collection. And the choices that they made were not necessarily the choices I would make, but they came up with a wonderful representation of the work that these artists are doing and making. And they also came up with new connections and new conversations that I hadn't seen before. So it's, it's part of the process of sharing your work, whether it's in the form of a book, whether it's inviting someone to come give a talk at your home and talk about the work in, the, in, your, in your collection through their point of view or perspective, whatever that may be, it will only make you a better collector. It will only make you smarter. It will only help you better understand the depth of the work you're collecting. It will only help answer that question. Oh, why did I do this? That's why I collected this artist. That's why this artist makes sense in my collection. That's why this artist fits the story I'm trying to tell. Well, that kind of engagement, your, your really personal engagement and positive engagement, I think uh, is gonna be life-changing for these artists. It already has been. And you, you've built a wonderful kind of uh, rapport, as you just mentioned, having dinners and studio tours. Um, you're, you're always looking. Uh, if, if everyone should follow you on your account on Instagram, 
for Young, Gifted and Black because you're always in an artist studio, you're always looking. And our, our discussions here at SWAN, you've always been uh, very open and uh, asking questions. And I think that's, uh, and it takes a certain patience and time. And I think that really has served you well. You've done the legwork. <laughs> Uh, and um, some of those conversations that we've had, I, I think, has shown how um, when you look at art, you, you have to, you're not going to know everything and you have to, um, you're not gonna, it's not necessarily going to be immediate. Um, that, that's part of the process. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think part of your just to go on what you're saying now and also to refer back to your previous question, you know, where do I collect, you know, people often ask that where do you find your work or where do you, you know, where do you discover art? And, you know, I think any smart collector will tell you this, that you have to avail yourself of all of the available platforms and outlets. Um, being someone who focuses on emerging artists, obviously the studio, the artist studio, or a conversation with the artist is, it's frequently a starting point for me. Um, and I love that, as you can tell, I love talking about art. I didn't study art history in school. I didn't get a degree in art. I didn't grow up with parents or grandparents pointing out to me, you know, the beauty of Picasso's Demoiselle de Avignon. Is that Matisse or Picasso? Picasso. Thank you. Okay. Um, but instead, I took it upon myself to make artists be my teachers. So whenever I go to their studios, I, what I love about that is that I'm not in a gallery. I'm not in a museum. I'm not um, in an auction house. I'm just sitting with an artist. They're trying to figure something out and I have the privilege of learning as they are figuring that out. So an artist studio is one place where you collect, but also just as importantly, galleries, as any collector will tell you, knowing a gallery, having conversations, being in conversation with dealers, particularly gallerists who are committed to the sort of artist or the sort of stage of artists that you're collecting is obviously very important. And you have to support artists at all levels. Uh, you have to support them at the studio level. If they need to sell something to pay rent, that's supporting an artist. If you're at a gallery, you're buying a work from their show, that's supporting an artist. If a museum calls you up and says, we're doing a show with this artist we know you collect and love, would you please loan a work? Or would you please contribute support for the exhibition? That's supporting an artist. And even when you're in an auction house, for me, Auction previews are some of the places where I have learned so much about art and collecting. You know, whatever you say about auctions or the process, an auction preview is a really rare and amazing example to see a lot of great work in one place at one time. And it's also a place where this community piece, which I'm always talking about, happens. And Nigel at Swan, you know, when I was starting out building this collection, I really didn't know that many other collectors of African-American art. And that also means I didn't know that many black collectors. And I really felt that this was coming from a place of purpose and I wanted to build community around what I was doing and I wanted to connect with other collectors. And it was at previews for your sales, like the sale happening now and the work behind you that I would come and spend, you know, I would come to look at, you know, a Norman Lewis painting or a Barclay Hendricks painting, or to see a work on paper by Elizabeth Catlett or Charles White. And then I would run into someone, inevitably another collector, someone from the Studio Museum or from MoMA, and we would have conversations. And through those conversations, I learned about all of these things that I'm telling you now. I learned about the choices collectors make. I learned about the perspective and the, <clears throat> and the point of view that other collectors had. And I also learned something which, you know, Bell Hooks talks about, the theorist, um, in terms of what the African-American home meant for so long and still means. But this was before galleries and museums were showing work by African-American artists. We were the caretakers of this cultural capital. We maintained the heritage and we passed it down. Part of that was holding salons in your home where you would invite other collectors, friends, family members, the community into the home to share an experience and see this art. And that's how art was passed down. So hanging out at Swan for me became another way to make those connections and to learn. And I'm, I'm very indebted to that. I mean, I had not seen, I knew who Norman Lewis was, but I had not seen the work. I knew who Elizabeth Catlett was, but I had not seen, you know, a sculpture. I knew Charles White 
from pictures and books, but to really stand in front of, of these works was really for me very special. And to talk with someone else about those works and to make discoveries like, like William Edmondson, like, you know, a sculptor whom very few, I think relatively few people still know, very influential. Uh, that's the sort of discoveries that happen in places where people gather to look at art. And I'm very grateful and thankful. And that's one reason why I wanted to, to come on the show tonight, Nigel, was as a way to say thank you for helping me learn and providing a space where others could gather safely and sort of, you know, share their passion. Thank you. Thank you. That it's really been a, a learning experience. And we, we do love this community that you mentioned. I mean, I've been uh, really fortunate to have interacted with so many great connectors, uh, collectors, <laughs> connectors. Well, they are connectors. Right. Uh, and, and this is an area where um, I, I've had to be very sensitive uh, and you have to be very careful and respectful in this area because so much of the community uh, even with the first generation or second generation of artists, it's still very close to the artist, still very close to the family. Um, many of the holdings and the estates and descendants we work with are just one step away from the artist and the studio itself. Um, so uh, we we really enjoyed that community, building that here and 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 having you be a part of it. Uh, it's been it's been quite a journey, fifteen years. Uh, you've probably been coming here for 15 years now. <laughs> it's hard to believe. Uh, and uh, it's, it's really an exciting uh, moment now for, for African-American art. It's, it's, it's such a difference night and day from when we started, when you start, first started looking to this in, uh, immense uh, global interest now in the production of, of this generation that you're champion, um, the, the vision of tremendous changes in, in that world. And, and you can only imagine what would happen in the next 15 years. <laughs> well, what do you see it in the future. I mean, it's, we've come so far, there's been like now, I mean, I think it's undeniable the recognition of the great contributions of so many of these American artists to what we call American art. You know whether it's uh, Charles Wyatt or Hugh Lee Smith or Elizabeth Kellett or or more recent generations who are trailblazers who are um, sh showing new representations of what it means to be uh, an American, you know, di diverse uh, of African descent or color. What what do you see? Um, you know, your, your your collection now has has grown quite a bit, and your you're, you're traveling, the exhibition is traveling to many colleges and museums. Um, and, and so that's really been, uh, you're, you're really projecting forward and, and showing the work. Um, how, how do you, where do you, where do you see it going? You, you, you're, are, are you going to be more involved with the collection in a, and, and is it going to become more of a an institutional idea or a foundation or have you have you changed your idea of what the collection would be? I mean, <laughs> it's a good question and I, I can't, you know, predict the future. Um, you know, in regard to your point about where the market is now, the art market <clears throat> versus where it was, you know, when I first started hanging out as Swan, it, it really is true, Nigel. It's sort of like a bunch of people crashed our party, um, <laughs> but, but that's a good thing, right? Yeah. Of course, that's a good thing, especially for the artists. Um, but, you know, so that's, that's been really interesting to watch. And, you know, I, again, feel, you know, at one of the, um, in the book, you know, I talked to Thelma Golden, the director and chief curator of the Studio Museum. And a lot of what I'm saying in terms of this lineage of black patrons, uh, is in that book. A lot of what I'm saying about the importance of making space for artists to come together and to meet the world, the rest of the world uh, is in that conversation in the book. Um, and one of the things that we talk about also is a little bit about the market and how we feel and what we imagine might happen in the future. 
you know, one of the things that we land on, you know, I think collectors who are committed to African American art uh, that I know of <clears throat> is that, you know, we were doing this, and this I can make reference to Elaine Locke, you know, the patron saint of the Harlem Renaissance, who, you know, at, at you know, um, HBCUs like Morehouse and Spellman was the first voice of, you know, we have to build an art collection. We should be sending students abroad and teaching them about the history of art, you know, in Africa. Uh, he was sort of the first patron in a sense, uh, or one of the models of, of patron. Or, you know, more recently, someone like Peggy Cooper K. Fritz, uh, who also made her home a salon, who also uh, went deep in, with supporting emerging artists, young artists. Um, you know, I think we were doing that work when the rest of the world wasn't looking. We were doing that work because, sure, we all have the art collecting bug. Sure, we love objects. Sure, we love the chase, you know, chasing paintings is great. And we all have to have that, right? But I think there was and is a deeper sense of purpose and meaning. And I think for me, that gets back to the community piece and the family piece. And, you know, I really started going deep with collecting, you know, after school, I worked at MTV for many years. I was a TV producer. And it was only until, which was wonderful in many ways, and sort of taught me more about the value of sort of having an educational purpose. I worked for the part of MTV that was sort of like the PBS part of MTV. Um, and I also worked with a lot of artists. He was here in New York. And for many artists, whether you were a graphic designer or an illustrator or an animator, this was their day job, MTV. So it was my first experience working with artists. And it was also my first experience using a big, you know, um, having a platform and using sort of art as an educational tool. Um, but I realized that we could, um, you know, I realized that with, you know, um, I'm trying to think what I, my point there was, it was the idea that um, you could sort of build, uh, you know, community around what you were doing. And, and the idea that, you know, sort of whatever happened in the marketplace, we would still be supporting and collecting these artists. Right. And I think that's what I think about when I think of the future. I just think about the purpose around the purpose that brought me to this game, as it were, and what I think in terms of what will happen in the future. And I think following the artist's lead is always a good example. I think artists have experimented in forms that I didn't sort of know that much about and didn't think of that much about uh, for many years. And now I know and learn and am learning a lot more about it. Um, I serve on the media and performance committee at MoMA, which is an amazing experience because a lot of the work on that committee that we consider for acquisition or for the ex for an exhibition is new media, it's video, it's performance. It's not meant to be collected. It's not meant to be lived with and it in some ways frees me to, to be a pure patron, to just think about what is what does this work need? What's the best place for this work? What's the best way that I can help this artist? And it's often has to do with just helping the work get in, be in a museum context where it can be properly cared and, cons and conserved and it displayed and installed. Um, so I think that, you know, that's important. Yeah, I can't predict the future and, I don't know what will happen with the overheated art market, particularly now around artists of African descent. But I think whatever happens, you know, the Peggy Cooper Kafrises of the world, the Elaine Locks of the world, the Thelma Goldens of the world, you know, they will still be doing, <clears throat> they would still, or they will still be doing what they're doing. And right. I'd like to think that I would be in that, you know, in that group with that same purpose. That's that's very well put. I think we're 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 pursuing uh, good goals beyond, uh, and and you're you've established um, such a such a a beachhead for all these young artists to get beyond that. They're they're like they're now you know able and to open up their practice and be daring and do things that really they want to in 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 their artistic practice. Um, because of the, you know, the opportunity and the success uh, and the support of patrons like, like you. Uh, yeah. So, 
You're doing- I mean, I was, it's interesting, Nigel, I was just thinking, you know, one of the points that I was trying, that I was making, um, you know, one more biographical point about my father, you know, one of the turning points in my journey, if you want to call it that as a collector was when my father became very sick with cancer and I took time off from my job at MTV and I went back to California and I spent what would become the last six months of his life with him and helping my mother and helping care for my father. And during that period, he and I talked a lot. There was a lot of conversations and he told me stories about his family that I didn't know. And he shared his sort of thoughts and ideas and reflections on, you know, growing up black in America on, you know, being a scientist, um, growing up in Watts, realizing he wanted to be a physicist. His family didn't have enough money to buy him a chemistry set or a telescope. Um, He built a telescope from scratch. And I just have this image of my father, you know, a teenager in Watts in the late 50s or early 60s, you know, standing in his yard or on the rooftop of his parents' house, pointing that telescope up to the stars and imagining for himself, you know, a different future, you know, a different, a different life, a different existence that no one else would imagine for him. Um, So I feel that, you know, I was lucky that I had sort of these turning points and these figures for me that modeled for me what, what an artist does, staring into the future, hoping to give us a a better vision or a better um, perspective on our own lives. Um, but, you know, that's what that's for me, what was a turning point, you know, some of those conversations with my father and the end of his life were questions that stayed with me. And I wanted to continue to ask those questions. Uh, and that's where the collection was born. I wanted to support and be in conversation and be in dialogue with artists who were also asking questions that about identity, about family, about history. And you know, even this morning at the Whitney Biennial, an artist um, named Rick Lowe, whose work you'll see when the show opens tomorrow, I was there this morning for a preview, and the artist was there. You know, Rick Lowe is an artist who many people until very recently knew as a social practice artist. Right. He started at something in Houston called the Project Row Houses, yes. uh, which is probably um, what most people think of now when they think of Rick Lowe, maybe before the biennial, maybe afterwards, they'll think of him, yes. his beautiful work that he's making now. But in the same way that the Astor Gates is sort of a community-based practice, exactly. you know, Rick Lowe is the same thing. And he was telling me, you know, standing in front of this huge painting, which I'm sure many of you will hopefully get to see, you know, where the origin of the work comes from and, you know, how it grew out of his um, experience playing dominoes in public and the paintings are sort of an abstracted version of that social experience. So the painting reflects sort of the game of dominoes and it looks like it could be dominoes, but it's also much bigger and broader than that. You know, Rick Lowe is an accomplished artist showing with Gagosian Gallery now in New York, huge painting in the, in the Whitney Biennial. And he said to us, the group of us there, he was like, look, I'm still learning what this work is about. You know, if you're an artist who cares about social practice, who is making work in the community with the collaboration and the involvement of the community, like the Watts Towers, you know, you're not gonna have answers. You're just, you're there to sort of provide some, some, you know, visions of what could be an answer. And he's like, even this work that I'm making now, it's like, I don't fully understand where it will go or what will happen to it. And I think as a collector too, first of all, I think that's an amazing sentiment for an artist to say that as an established successful artist, to say that, you know, they don't necessarily know what the work will become. The work is still something they're figuring out. I would say the same thing about this collection and your question about, you know, what will happen in in the years to come, how I envision my role and my place is I'm not sure. I'm still trying to answer those questions I talked about with my father, you know, at the end of his life. So I'm not sure where where the questions will lead me. I just know that in answering the questions and in sharing that search, you know, is partly what one will be one way to get there. And I think sharing that search with the world is partly what is definitely one thing I can continue to do in one form or another, whether it's through a book or an exhibition, supporting artists at a museum, connecting people together. That's one thing that I'm sure I'll continue to do. Well, you put it perfectly, poetically, Bernard, that was lovely. I, I think it would be a good time, a good moment for you 
uh, for, for us to pause. Uh, we, we do have a number of questions. Kelsey, do you? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll start us off with a couple of questions here, Bernard. Um, there's a few people in our Q&A um, discussing, you know, gatekeeping and barriers to entry regarding, you know, uh, being an African-American collector and what can they do to breach these boundaries that have been set in place by other people within the art world and how can they overcome these um, these walls that have been put up? Um, so the question is sort of what, how can collectors gain access to um... buying emerging artists, being able to purchase um, and just get into the collecting world and art world as a space? Yeah, it's a good it's a good question. And, you know, the art world can be can and you know has been traditionally and, and continues to be sort of exclusive, you know, regardless of, you know, what sort of prejudices lie beneath that economic, racial or whatever. Um, I think just start small, start with something specific, you know, give yourself a budget of whatever amount a month, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, whatever. That's a lot, sorry, whatever, whatever it is, whatever your budget is, <laughs> start with, a, start with a, your passion, start with a question you have, something you want to resolve and just dive into it and talk to other people about it and figure out you know, where you can make connections with people who will support what that, what that passion is. Um, you know, art, art is a business which takes money, but, you know, people often ask me, I often am asked for money to support things, which is wonderful, but I often say, look, I love to give, but I love even more to get. And, you know, thankfully I, I have, um, you know, a lot of friends who have deeper pockets than I do. And, and, you know, people love to be asked to help something. And if they believe in you, then they'll believe in that cause. So it's really, it really comes down to your passion. Like if your passion, people will feed off of that. They'll respond to that. They'll believe in you. And so often when I'm asked for something, if I can't give the amount, the, if I can't give what they're asking, I won't say no, I'll say, I'll find another way to get that or I'll find someone else to get that. And that's, I think, because people get excited about what you're excited about. Excellent. I think that's really great advice for anybody in this industry. Um, we have another question here um, saying you are being honored by City Arts um, in their upcoming gala in June. And um, that education is at the heart of your collection. And will you be going to schools to make talks about artists connecting people and bringing young minds to this um, collection? I guess younger than. Sure. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, thank you for that question, Sippy. And obviously, I'm thrilled to be honored by City Arts, which is a great organization which supports artists, particularly young artists, our children, our kids who are making art and also teaching about the world through art um, and sharing it through a public practice. Um, so for those of you who don't already know what City Arts is, please, please look them up and think about supporting that kind of work. You know, I think as part of the Young, Gifted and Black exhibition, we, true to my parents' example, I really wanted there to be robust public programming, educational programs around the exhibition. So for instance, the show is currently on view at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania. And I went a couple of weeks ago and uh, participated in a panel with two of the artists. So, you know, I feel that, yes, I will be going to schools and universities talking about what I do, but even more importantly, I think I will be making it possible for artists to go to schools and university and talk about what they do. I think, you know, one of my sort of happiest moments following this exhibition and, you know, which started out as, you know, one, one semester at one small college in Westchester and is now, um, you know, a tour which will go through 2027 at colleges and universities around the country. My vision was always, you know, young, gifted, and Black young artists for young people to engage students, to engage university communities where there is a built in framework for debate and discussion and where classes can come to the show. One of my pleasures has been sort of like sneaking in 
to one of the exhibitions and just sort of watching and listening to a class, you know, to a teacher talk about um, a work of art and to listen to the students respond to a work of art and to sort of see their their connection, you know, that sort of magical thing that happens when we connect with the work of art. And for many of these students, probably they may not have seen images on the walls of a museum where they felt that there was a connection with their own family or their own experience. And so to be present for that and to help make more moments like that, I feel is, is what my role is. That's amazing. Um, and then I think we have time for maybe one final question. Um, if you, if someone already has a collection they feel is worthy of exhibition and being shown to people, how do you suggest they approach being able to elevate it and enter it into exhibition spaces? spaces? I think, um, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> Cause I didn't, I, you know, I, this wasn't formulaic. You have to understand it was very, um, someone came to me and said, and maybe just by telling this, maybe it'll give people some ideas of how this could happen. Just, you know, someone came, they knew that they, it was a university, the director of a small gallery at the um, Concordia College in Westchester, which actually doesn't, it's not even there anymore, but they had a small campus gallery and the director of the museum came to me and said, you know, we've heard about your collection and, you know, we have an amazingly diverse student body here at Concordia but we've never been able to show, to do an exhibition in the museum here that really reflects that diversity. And I was like, oh, that's, that's interesting. You know, I was, I, that sort of planted a seed or something. And she was like, would you mind consulting with us and trying to figure out an exhibition of work by African-American artists for our fall show? And so I started, I said, sure, you know, this is a great opportunity for me as a collector to do something more than just, you know, collect a work of art and hang it on my wall. It was like, this is someone who's engaging the idea of what I'm doing in a broader way. And I also thought of the artists in the collection. I thought, wow, wouldn't these artists love to be on a college campus rather than in my house? You know, just the work is in the world. It should be in the world. And so I started a conversation with her and it just, you know, a small campus gallery, not a big budget. And she's like, Bernard, we could easily borrow work from your collection and that could be the show. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And so it just started with that. And that became the show. She wanted to do a pamphlet. So we did a little pamphlet around the show. That one time show and that little pamphlet became an exhibition and a book because people saw it on that campus. Someone on her board from another college saw it. They wanted to take the show. Uh, DAP, our partners, in the book, wanted to publish, thought that there was a story here that was bigger than just the exhibition, that was a way to sort of, um, you know, uh, tell a story of a collection that was timely, but that was also personal. Um, I, I, like I said, I think it really starts with your passion. So don't, you don't have to think in terms of an exhibition or a book or this or that. Think, just have that passion and have that focus and communicate that to people and and they'll respond. And I think the best way to do that is to be in conversation with arts organizations or museums, because that's where the curators who wrote for the book, that's where the artists who generously supported the book, that's where the patrons and collectors who are watching you will want to learn about what you're doing. That's where they all are. So go to the place where art happens in that way, the places. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think that's a great place to wrap up. Um, thank you so much for sharing your time with us, Bernard. We really appreciate it. And I know all of the attendees appreciate it as well. You've shared some valuable, valuable knowledge with us tonight. Um, I want to remind everybody that our African-American art sale is happening March 31st. That's this Thursday. Um, so you can enter your collecting space um, this week if you so choose. Um, you can find all of our information about our sale online at swangalleries.com. Um, if you're interested in Bernard's collection, uh, his information and the collection information is at younggiftedinblack.com, I believe. Is that correct? Uh -huh. And that is also your social media handle as well. Young, Young Gifted Black. Black Art. Yes, on Instagram. Great. And you can follow our African-American art department at swan, A-A-A-F-A. -A -A 
um, on Instagram. Swan Auction Galleries is on Instagram and across social media at Swan Galleries. Thank you, Bernard. It's, it was really a, a wonderful, wonderful evening. We really enjoyed the conversation and uh, we look forward to seeing everyone soon. Thank you all. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you, Kelsey. Yeah, thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.